Let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us here tonight. And I thank you for your faithfulness and how we know that you are trustworthy. And that we know as we bow before you this evening that you are hearing us. And that, Father, you are in complete understanding of what's going on in our hearts, what's going on in our lives. How we're thinking, what needs to change about the way we're thinking, how we're living. What needs to change about the way we're living. You know all that you intend to do in our lives. You have communicated that in your word and how it is to conform us more and more to the image of your son and to give you glory by living out Christ likeness. I pray tonight as we study your word together and that our hearts would be ready and be open that we would be responsive to your word even as we move through it and that father you would have your way in each life we praise you for this time for the freedom that we enjoy for the fellowship that we enjoy together and father for your word now ready to speak to us we praise you in christ's name amen Joel, I'm going to ask you to grab those outlines. If you don't have an outline, I want you to let Joel know that. I have encouraged you through the years that you're probably no exception to the rule that those who, yeah, give Laura one, will you? <laughs> there are two ends of the educational spectrum. And part of my training was in regards to education. The one end of the end is those who sit and listen and think that they're grasping what's being said. The other end is those who write down, even in their own words, what is being said and go back and review that. Opposite ends of the educational spectrum. So the reason that we do this and the reason I'm emphasizing this tonight is for the next number of weeks, I am going to systematically try to lead you through what the Bible teaches about giving. And if you don't review it and you don't think about it and you don't pray about it, you will not be the exception. You won't be the one person that gets it despite the fact that you didn't give the energy to it. I remember teaching fifth grade. I don't know why that stands out so much in my mind, but maybe it's because of my first job out of college in a suburb of Chicago. They brought me in and said, we want you to take a fifth grade class in the Christian school. There are 31 students, 18 boys and 13 girls, and nobody wants to teach this class. I remember one young man who was from a broken home. His name was Chris Barr. He was 13 and still in the fifth grade. He brought nunchucks to show and tell, if you want to know what kind of dad taught martial arts. He was the guy on the playground you just prayed didn't get in a fight with somebody else. And I remember every day he tried to communicate to me, Mr. Aldous, I am not listening to you. I remember sitting down here, a girl named Rachel. I drove the school bus, too. If you're in Christian education, you do it all. You change the oil, you drive the bus, you run the youth group, you do it all. And she's sitting there day in and day out, just drinking in every single thing that she could learn and grasp. Those are two ends of the spectrum. Now, praise the Lord, that year Chris Barr got saved. And I heard uh, when somebody visited here for a wedding that he is an adult serving the Lord today. I remember when he got saved and I know God can and did change his heart. But I want to emphasize with you that, and if you sat here on a stool, I was just thinking today, we'll get the big stool up here and let each of you take a turn sitting here. If you watch the people that are not engaged in the message by doing something with it, you'd see the same thing I see. They check out because they never checked in. So let this be an admonition to you, an encouragement to you. And I know everything inside of you like me goes, right? Because our flesh says, don't tell me what to do. But I can guarantee you, you're not an exception. And if you really want to know what the Lord has to say about these things, you'll engage with me around the word of God. We'll benefit together and, and hopefully take some steps forward in our understanding. I have no idea what anybody gives, by the way, except me. No idea. Never have. 30 years right here have never known anything that anybody's given. So. I am not doing any teaching to offer a corrective to anybody. I'm doing what I'm called to do, and that is to tell you and teach you what the Word of God says, okay? So I, don't, I can't pick on anybody except myself. Uh, if I'm unfaithful as a steward, then I, 
I need to apply this to myself, but I don't know anything about you. So that, that I hope helps you. And I think the way Paul addresses this is the thing that just picks my heart up. Because historically, I have hesitated to preach on giving or money. One of the reasons is because the way I grew up, every time we had service, we passed the orphan plate around. And it was a big part of the service to try to get the money because we were building things and doing things we needed money for. There was a part of me in growing up in that and thinking and even understanding from my father's guidance that actually giving is part of worship. It's, it's really not, you know, raising a thermometer to try to raise funds to build a building that's beyond your means. That's not what it's all about. We sold bonds. We burnt mortgages in the pulpit because we had paid it off. It was just that kind of thing. And something in that just didn't set with my soul. So having walked through that, my mother told me more than once. She said, but, but Mike, you're their pastor. Who is going to teach people about giving? If you don't, that's your responsibility. And she was right. And because she said it, I didn't want to hear it, you know, but uh, she is right. Uh, but an another thing is that I don't want anybody to misunderstand that anything that I am communicating is for any purposes for myself. God called me here 30 years ago and we 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 came because God called us here. And so uh, I, I think you need to understand that. And your deacons have taken the initiative in a desire to speak with you men so that you will have a better understanding of where our monies go. I was sitting with them last night and showing them some things and, and helping them follow some things. And they said, we need, we need a chance to do this. We, need to, we want to do this with our men. We want, to, we, want, we want them to have the understanding that we have as to where, what's coming in and where it's going and that kind of thing. So your deacons are going to do that, men, in our men's meeting. Uh, and we postponed the business meeting so that we could kind of walk through that. Okay? We did experience a deficit this year of about $6,000. That's about $500 a month. So for us as a church, that has not ever happened. So this is new. So we praise the Lord for 30 years of that not happening, but it has happened. So what do you do? You live within your means. You tighten your belt. You communicate. You, you try to understand. And you encourage people that the way God intends to support his purposes in his ministry is through the giving, not of one person carrying it all, but of everybody uh, together, if we believe that this is what the Lord wants and we believe he wants us to continue doing these things, uh, the reason we've never led you to borrow any money is not because we're carrying around the debt free banner. It's because we were concerned that in time, as Satan does, he would disrupt and we would be in trouble if we had mortgages. And so thank the Lord for that. And be thankful for that. And be thankful for the chance to look at God's word. Uh, I'm always excited and eager and thought, you know what? I just like to preach both chapters. And then I, reality sets in. Because I get my introduction written. And I'm thinking, that ain't, that's not happening. So could I do this with you tonight? Could I give you an overall introduction? Could I give you an outlay of where we're going? And then hopefully cover the first part of 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Okay? If you look at uh, these two chapters together. The first part, verses 1 through 15 of chapter 8, is the appeal. The appeal. The apostle is admonishing the people of Christ church. And he, I love the way Paul does this. He does it with reminders. He does it with encouragement. He does it by lending clarity. So if you, if you took a way to divide this in three pieces, the first 15 verses of chapter 8 is the appeal. Verses 16 to 24 of chapter 8 is what I'm calling the administration. And what happens here is Paul begins to talk about trusted men who are going to be trusted with the monies that are being gathered to help the poor saints. And so there's principles here in verses 16 to 24, which folks have really driven and dictated what we have done as a church. There's an accountability here. There's a, there's a check, there are checks and balances that go on here. It's been a challenge for us because the banks don't want to acknowledge that or do that anymore. But we are saying, now we want four men to see this. We, we want everybody involved. Well, you know where that comes from? It comes from Paul. He said, I want to talk to you about Titus. 
I want to talk to you about other brothers that you as the churches have chosen to administer these funds. I, I trust that encourages you. There's, there's nothing that we do not want you to be aware of. And there's an accountability here where, where nobody can do anything by themselves and where this pastor can't do anything about anything with any of the banking. It comes to, come to the post office box, the requisitions are made. I know what's going on because I need to know what's going on. But as far as any of those details, Paul helps us there. And he wants those people to know you got trusted men who are going to carry these funds over there. And Paul in the middle of that says, no, please understand, I'm not going to get wealthy through this offering. He says that. that you need to understand that. We're talking about inspired scripture. There's an appeal in 15 verses. There's administration. In verses 16 through 24, and I'm calling, just to say with the A's, I'm calling chapter 9 the admonition. You could use the word motivation, and we will see that. There's 15 verses there about the admonition of Paul. So Paul's approach is guided by God's Spirit to this subject matter, and he changes gears here. Now he's going on to a new subject matter when we turn to chapter 8, is the first 15 verses an appeal Verses 16 to 24 of chapter 8, the administration, the how, the how of the collection. Let's get this money together. The who, who are going to be the trusted envoys to carry this money, to deliver it. The what, you need to understand the whole process, Paul says. So that's the administration in verses 16 to 24. And then the admonition of chapter 9 has to do with initiative and motivation. The personal and corporate participation. Uh, this encourages us because it gives us um, spiritual perspective. And I trust in the weeks to come, we'll be able to harvest some uh, principles, some spiritual principles. Now, I call this grace giving. And tonight, this is an introduction to grace giving. And I think you will see why. Verse number one of chapter eight, verse one of chapter eight, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, <laughs> that's, that's the old language uh, that is, is Paul is using in, in terms of uh, encouraging these people, getting these people involved. We do you to wit of, when you take note of this, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So when Paul is going to give two chapters to the subject matter of giving, he starts in terms of the grace of God. He said, I want to bring you face to face with God's favor, with God's blessing, with God's heart, with God's work, with God's provision. All of this is about God's grace, the way he's provided for us, the way he allows us to be entrusted with uh, stewards of the things that he's given us. It is a relational term that's precious to believing people. We do you to wit. We want you to know. He wants you to know this. And what he wants them to know is how the grace of God was at work in the churches at Macedonia. Now, the churches at Macedonia were depleted financially. They were poor. There had been a number of civil wars between Roman leadership. If you did your history reading, there's Caesar and Pompey. There's Brutus and Cassius. There's Augustus and Antonius. Because of that, Macedonia was a very, very poor area. So Paul is going to, first of all, say, I want to talk to you about the grace of God. And I want to stand up before you an example. I want to show you an example, and that is the churches of Macedonia. Now, notice what he says in verse number two. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. The grace of God looked like this. They were in a great trial of affliction. But when you put together the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, what came out of that was the riches of their liberality. Really wouldn't be what you expect. For to their power, okay, to their credit, here's a testimony in verse 3, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. So not only their ability, but beyond their ability, they were willing of themselves. 
Listen to verse 4. Praying us, Paul says, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Paul says this group in their poverty, in their abundance of joy, were liberal like this. They came to us and beseeched us, ask us if we would please get involved in taking their gift to minister to the suffering saints. Verse 5 says, he says, and this they did. Now, not as we hoped, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So let's start this evening by, by settling in our souls this issue of grace giving. First of all, grace giving is the fruit, the fruit of God's grace at work in us. It's the fruit of God's grace at work in us. Paul says, even when in sore trials, these Macedonian believers, they were needy themselves. They were in a great trial of affliction. They were in the midst of a severe test. But they heard about Christians elsewhere suffering. And Paul said, they came to us. They took the initiative and came to us and said, could we please help? Could we get involved in ministering in this way? He says, they're overflowing happiness. And their poverty, in the very depths of their destitution, combined together into a, the wealth of their generosity, the riches of their liberality, he says, a wealth of gen, uh, generosity. Now, verse number three says, according to their ability, for to their ability, their power, I bear record, yea, beyond their ability or power, they were willing of themselves according to their ability and beyond so grace giving is the fruit of god's grace at work in us first of all and you know this but i want you to be encouraged by this originating at the soul level originating at the soul level i expect that i'm speaking to people tonight who love to give i really do I believe that you look forward of your own accord. The old word would be what? A free will offering. You want to. I think that's what Paul is saying. That's exactly where we need to be. It, it needs to be that God's grace in our lives is compelling us. It's a, it's, the reason I use originating here is because you listen to Paul. He said they came to us. You know what? I think the Apostle Paul would have been slow to go to them. Let's try. I mean, those churches needed help at times. And you're going to see that later in the text. He actually says those churches can help these churches. And the time will come where these churches will need to help these churches. You remember what happened at Jerusalem? They were poverty stricken. And Paul went on his ministry and he talked with Gentile believers, and Gentile believers wanted to help the Jerusalem church. And that originated from God's grace, that originated at the soul level. Secondly, it's overflowing in spiritual worship. Our word there is worship. And as you look at this and review this and pray over this, this is what we want. We want God's grace to be flowing in our lives. Every time we give, we want to give because that originates in our souls, and that is the overflowing of spiritual worship. There are multiple fronts in which we can give, multiple fronts in which we minister. But this is spiritual fruit, and he says, actually, they gave beyond their ability. Thirdly, the fruit of God's grace at work in us, initiating selfless expressions. That's our word. Initiating selfless expressions of faith spontaneous personal involvement. You know what? I see that sometimes in action with our young people right here. I just see it happen. And I know that because they've had an example in those that aren't so young here. <laughs> but nothing thrills my heart more than to recognize, you know what? They're looking at me or they're looking at Tim or they're looking at Chad or looking at somebody and they're going, what can we do? You know what that is? 
That's right here. That's, I want to. The same thing is true in our giving. Uh, there's no covetousness here, no miserliness here, no stinginess here. It's like, wow, you know, here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity to worship the Lord by giving not only financially, but giving even here, he says in verse 5, beyond my expectation. Beyond my expectation. He says, and this they did not as we hoped in verse 5. He said, I really, this was not what I was anticipating. But first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. The will of God is going to come up multiple times in our text. Initiating selfless expressions of faith, Paul said it went beyond my expectation. And lastly, manifesting a core devotion to Christ and his people. They heard some others needed something. They heard of their poverty and these poor believers gave of themselves in their poverty because of God's grace in their lives. Now, Paul's going to offer something later that is very important for us to understand. And that he says, you know, I'm not suggesting that you further your own poverty by giving to someone else. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is the grace of God is working in you so that when you see that need, you are meeting that need. So let me just stop here and talk to you about the spirit of giving. I wanted to make sure we distilled this down so we could take it with us and think it out and say, let's go back to the text and look, is this what Paul is saying? In his spirit of giving here, first of all, in verse one, there's an awareness. There's an awareness of God's grace toward us. Now, one of the examples that Paul is going to use in the text is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But I think the reminder for us in the midst of all of this is unless I'm living in a constant awareness of God's grace toward me, I'm not going to be ready for this issue of grace giving, right? God's grace that I'm alive. God's grace that I can work. God's grace that I can be involved in what he's doing. I can participate in what he's doing. All of this has that, that worship aroma about it. The spirit of giving is an awareness of God's grace toward us. Now, is that not Paul's pattern in every single thing he writes? Can't get over it, can he? he he'll, he'll just be writing along and it's like he gets carried away and he just stops and through three or four verses of this, praise to God for his grace. He can't pick up his pen without saying what to you? Grace to you. God's favor to you. He can't talk about God's uh, sanctifying work in our lives without first reminding us of God's saving work in our lives. And he's going to argue very hard for the fact that you get that confused, you're in trouble. Because if you're not saved, you cannot be sanctified. If you're not resting in God's grace for salvation... You're going to get all busy and you're going to get all agitated and you're going to get all focused and you're going to work yourself to death trying to be like Christ. And he says, you know what? Let me help you. God is the one that makes you like Christ. The Holy Spirit makes you like Christ. Your need is to recognize his grace in salvation. Surrender to his grace in sanctification. Reckon yourselves what? Dead indeed into sin. He's saying get involved. But he said not getting involved because we can do this, but getting involved by submitting to God's grace work and conforming us more and more to the image of his son. So we dare not miss this focus that Paul uses consistently. Now it's being applied in this area of giving, a spirit of giving, an awareness of God's grace toward us. Secondly, verse number two, a joyous generosity. That's the example he sets up, a joyous generosity despite severe trial. He said, I want to give you an example of this right up front. The Macedonian churches were full of joy and were impoverished. And they said to me, what can we do to help those suffering believers? And lastly, verses three through five, a personal passion. 
to give of self. And he makes that point. They gave first in verse five, they gave their own selves to the Lord. So when I'm thinking about this arena, this area of giving in my life, I have to recognize it's simply going to flow out of him having me. If he has me, he has everything, right? It, it, there's nothing that, that I have not received from him. There's nothing that is not his. And when I get to give some of what he's entrusted to me, then that passion that drives that is a passion that's driven by the fact that I'm his. I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. There's genuine love in action. And this just spilled out of those people at Macedonia. So Paul begins with an anchoring in the grace of God. I'm, I'm not as good at this as I'd like to be, but I hope I'm growing in this. Personally, as a dad, as a pastor, anchoring always in the grace of God. And so he illustrates this reality through a church's example, the church, the churches in Macedonia were willing to give themselves by the will of God. Verse number five. Now notice, he introduces Titus because Titus has already been involved with this and he talks about that back in 1 Corinthians. But Titus is going to kind of lead the way for the delivery of this gift to those churches in need. So verse six, he says, in so much that we desire Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you. And notice the terminology again. What? The same grace also. So we needed a leader to help facilitate what is going on in the receiving of these gifts and the delivering of these gifts to the needy believers. I'm asking you to turn back just a couple of pages to chapter 16. I'll show you three verses just so you and I can catch up with what Paul is actually talking about in verse number six. Now, these people have already received the first letter. They're receiving the second letter. And you and I are looking at this saying, so what was begun that Titus now is going to finish? First Corinthians 16, verse number one. Now concerning the collection for the saints, there it is. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. Here's a principle that we'll get to in our, along the way as God hath prospered him. That there be no gatherings when I come. Paul is desiring that they would get these things ready. And when I come. Whosoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So that is the setting that he's referring to in our text in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, where he says, therefore, or inasmuch that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. You know what you're beginning to get here? At least when I was reading and rereading this, what kept coming up to me was um, evidently we need to be encouraged in these things. We need to be reminded of these things. And I thought, well, that's not any different than any other truth. Peter says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to write it down. So when I'm gone, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep bringing back to your remembrance the things that you have learned. So I'm listening to Paul talk to these people at Corinth. It kind of it kind of causes my defenses to go down when I say, OK, God knows that these people need a word of encouragement. He knows that somebody representing the apostle, that is Titus, needed to be there and help them get those things together because Paul didn't want to show up and the money wasn't there to take to the needy saints. And he talks in these terms about embarrassment. <laughs> he said, I, you know, Corinthians, I'm boasting in you. It's very funny because later in the chapter, he says, I boast to you, to the Macedonians. Here he's boasting to the Corinthians 
the Macedonians. Macedonians did this. He turns it the other way later on in the passage. So what Paul is doing is facilitating these things and encouraging these things and knowing that unless someone gets involved, these things won't be ready. And one of those threads that you'll keep hearing is readiness, 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 readiness. So there is planning involved in this. There, there is a, a decision that has to be made in this by individuals and by the churches. If this is going to unfold, and Paul is going to have to be involved as he is as the apostle and guiding the Corinthian church forward. Now, when my heart is humble before the Lord and my heart is honest before the Lord, I realize I need guidance. I, re- I do. And you do. No matter how much you know. Because our Christianity is not ha- about how much we know. It's about who we are. And who you are is something God is shaping with repetitive, with repetitive teaching of the same thing over and over and over again by getting other people involved. Now, those people get their hands up and start getting ready to resist Titus. The grace of God wouldn't do that in their lives. The grace of God would get them ready because Paul says, you know what? That's what I did. I went to him and said, go finish. Go finish in the Corinthians that same Grace. He uses the same word. Look at verse number seven. He's going to use the word again. You're going to begin to see, okay, this is why we're calling it grace giving. Look at verse seven. Therefore, as ye abound in everything. You remember what Paul said to the church in the first letter? He said, you folks have it all. You're abounding in everything. He repeats it here. In faith. The Corinthian church was strong in faith. In utterance. They were strong in that. They were gifted in that. Knowledge. They had that as well. Diligence. The Corinthian believers were diligent. And in their love toward Paul and his companions. Okay. You abound in everything. Faith, utterance, knowledge, diligence, your love to us. Here's the instruction. Here's the admonition. Here's the call. See that ye abound in this grace also. So, Grace is doing this in your life. Complete the grace. Abound in this grace. Excel. Excel in this as well. Now, I don't know what Paul felt as he wrote, but I do know he was human. I know he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but I also know that many times he just kind of walks us and reasons us along. So you're you're almost sensing that he would do what we would do when I speak to you and I speak directly and strongly to you. Then there's a sense in which you kind of kind of rebound back and go, OK, I want to make sure with the grit there's grace. Right. You want to listen to what he does. I speak not by commandment. Verse eight. I said, I'm not writing to you to boss you around about this. But by occasion of the frowardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. He says, I am encouraging you, not commanding you. And the reason I am encouraging you and not commanding you by example and by opportunity is so that you will have the privilege of proving the genuineness of your love. The word forwardness, again, is an older word that has to do with diligence. And so I think at this point, he just comes alongside him and puts his arm around him and says, now, please understand what's going on here. Yeah, I, I don't want this. All right, Paul said, we got to do this. Let's get it done. I said, that's really not the spirit here. That's not the spirit of grace. I'm trying to explain to you, he says that these people wanted to do this. These people's heart was in this. You people initiated this. You want to do this. And and I'm used of God here to facilitate an opportunity for you. Look at the last phrase of verse number eight to prove the sincerity of your love. And then he stands up the ultimate illustration, doesn't he? Okay, I've got an example in the Macedonians. Now I've got an example in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he uses the same terminology, verse 9, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And though he was rich, had it all, was in glory, yet for your sakes he became poor. He gave up that glory for this reason, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He said, let me give you the ultimate testimony and example of what we're talking about in grace giving. Look at the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And herein, he says in verse 10, I give my advice. For this is expedient. That means best. Best. This is good for you. Who have begun before. This is something you've already been doing. Not only to do, but also to be, there's our word again, diligent. To be forward a year ago. You were eager. You were committed. You were willing you were diligent a year ago. Now, therefore, verse 11, perform the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to will a year ago, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. Not just good intentions, Paul says. Let's, let's have a plan. Let's do this. Verse 12, for if there be first... Goes back to that willingness, doesn't he? If there's first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. He said, I want you to understand what's going on in your heart and soul it has to be connected to what you are able to do. Your ability, a willing mind. For I mean not that other men be eased and you burdened. Paul is so careful in heading off wrong thinking, but by an equality that now at this time, your abundance may be a supply for their want. That at another time, their abundance also may be a supply for your want. He repeats his word that there may be an equality. As it is written, he ends that, that appeal with these words, Referring back to the Old Testament, you remember the gathering of the manna. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over. He had what he needed. And he that had gathered little had no lack. All of that was provided for by the Lord. Readiness. And then performance. So grace giving, secondly tonight, let's bring these things together, is not only the fruit of God's grace at work in us, but it's the proof, the proof of participation in his work. And if you followed through with me in that, you saw that Paul's emphasis is, first of all, not just willing, but what? Doing. Okay, you had the readiness, you had the intention, you had the commitment, it's time to do it, okay? It's time to give. That's what he says. And then secondly, not mere intention, but action. That's what Paul's doing. He's inviting, he's compelling, he's encouraging these people to do what they started a year before. And he's sending along some help, we're going to read that next week, sending along some help. Some trusted servants who the people themselves recognize as trusted servants to collect these things and get them to the people that are in need. So we're going to harvest principles for giving. Now, first of all, we need to view all of life as a stewardship. Now, when you heard the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel talks about talents, do you remember those all those parables? It's stewardship. He's, he's teaching about stewardship. Uh, what have I given, given steward to stewardship of? Well, uh, I think, first of all, all of life. I have to be a steward of life itself. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean, 24, 7, 168 hours a week. I'm God's. I'm God's. And when that's the case, something like getting together with you folks and worshiping God and studying the Bible, it's a non-issue for me because I'm his all the time. To take my check, what I get from the church, and to take that opportunity to put something in those envelopes so that every week, by plan, 
I can give something as part of my worship. That, that is a non-issue with me because I know every dime that I have and everything that I'm a steward of belongs to him. And I take great delight in standing there at my desk every week, every first of every month, doing that. That way, Sunday morning, when I got my message together, I'm ready to go, take that envelope out, head to church. But if you ever get here, I put it in the box. My act of worship to the Lord is something I want to do. It's something I want to do every week, so I have to divide it up and do it that way. But it's something that is intentional because it's part of my worship to God. So if, if I have $1,000, $100 of that is a tithe that I give back to him. And then I get an opportunity to decide if I want to add some more to missions or even give beyond the 10%. And one of the things that we need to help our young people understand, if granny sends you $25 for your birthday, the first fruits of that, if you do, if you, if you listened to mom teach you math, is what? Quiz. $2.50. It's God's. So I'm doing this. That's God's. I'm going to put the rest of this over here because that's what I'm supposed to live off of and take care of planning for the future with. That's what I pay the bills with. I don't say, you know, I got a hundred bucks and when I'm done with my $7 coffee and my $4 donut and whatever else I want to do, I'll toss a little bit in the plate. That's not worship. That's last fruits. That's leftovers. And you don't think God knows that? You don't think when you think that way and I think that way, God doesn't know that? There's a first fruit principle in the scripture that's established. There's a tithing principle established in the scripture before the law. We'll take a look at that. And it's very interesting to me that the compromising church has depreciated two things primarily. There's more than two. The fourth commandment, the Lord today, I'll take that for myself. And the tithe, I'll keep that for myself. And you and I can't believe that's an advancement in spirituality from what we just read tonight. That's a misunderstanding of the grace of God. God gave me that $25. And my stewardship goes here, Lord. Right there. First thing, before I ever plan on what I'm going to spend it on, there's yours. That is an act of worship. That is a wonderful privilege for us as God's people. And I know most of you here tonight... Uh, Embrace that and believe that. I, I, I sense that. I've never questioned that. Principles for giving view all of life as a stewardship. All of it belongs to God and has been entrusted to us. How many days do you have? Seven. How many days are God's? Seven. How many has he set apart as holy and said, Mike, I want you to take that one. And it to be distinctively done. I want you to work six. Okay, he's Lord of those days, right? He's Lord of the six days. I want you to work, Mike, six days. And the seventh day, I want you to stop doing that and do this. What a privilege. How could there be any resistance in me to that? You say, well, you're a pastor. That's expected of you. What if I wasn't a pastor? How could it still not be the most precious thing I could think of? First thing God blessed, first thing God said was holy. So I think the, the reasoning, the rationale is, you know, the old legalist, you're into that tithing stuff. How do you call somebody a legalist when God's into that? And when God, how many times did he tell us, this is how I take care of my, this is how I take care of my ministry. We go to the Old Testament. What are we going to do? Well, you're going to bring some bread, right? Got to take care of the God that's feeding you spiritually, right? You don't starve the ox. I'm not sure I like that parallel, but, you know, don't muzzle the ox. But the point is, doesn't then Paul explain this? The point is you, he ministers to you spiritually. You minister to him what? Physically. It's just the way it is. Because that's God's plan on how to take care of the church. That's how to turn the lights on, how to pay the power bill, how to, you know, do the things we need to do. And I just am very uh, privileged and thankful to be part of that. I hope you are. Recognize, secondly, God's lordship over everything. If you want to scratch down this verse and go look at it later, when I say Proverbs 3, you and I both think of 
that section uh, four, five, and six. Um, trust in the Lord, five, six, and seven. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But look, listen to verse 9 and 10. This is Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. The wise man says, just honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of your increase. So we say, Lord, this is a stewardship. You are Lord over this. You are my creator. You're my redeemer. You're my sovereign. Here's my, here's my testimony. I'm bringing the first fruits. We're going to look at that, not tonight, but back in Leviticus. Uh, that testimony, and we'll try to look at some of the terminology there without getting too entangled with it. But that, that feast, there's seven feasts there. That feast of the first fruits was not only recognizing God as the giver of those, but that was trusting God for the rest. The idea there is that you're bringing the best first and you're giving that to God, but in doing so, you are trusting God to meet your every need. And the wise man just said that in that text, didn't he? The Lord's going to take care of you. He will take care of your needs. Lastly, settle. Settle into a plan of regular giving. As a priority part of worship, settle into a plan of regular giving, including the first fruits of everything. With a spirit of free will, with a spirit of rejoicing. So who benefits from this? Well, I think, first of all, if there's a way to speak of God in these terms, I would say God benefits because we are giving him the glory he deserves. And I think the glory of God is that umbrella, isn't it? That's over everything. Whether you eat or drink or give or whatever you do, do what? Do all of the glory of God. So you get to do this. I get to do this. I get to give these first fruits back to the Lord, and that brings glory to him. Also exalts Jesus Christ, doesn't it? It says, I am grace giving. I am responding to God's grace in my life. The ultimate giver is going to be exalted as I give. Now, pragmatically, we have a box at the back of the auditorium. You say, what's the box about? And I have to admit it was pragmatic. You say, what well, is pragmatic? Pragmatic is because it worked. Because the old school that we started in that's now torn down, we met in the gymnasium. And I preached from the gym floor up to the people in the stands. And, and it was hard to sleep in there. Because that was a middle school. So, Chad Wesley, imagine getting yourself all down in one of those little chairs with those little arms. So, I watched these guys go up the steps week after week to collect the offering. I was just waiting for one of them to come tumbling down to the gym floor to meet me. And so, I sat with the deacons one night and said, guys, why don't we just build a box and set it right there where you start to go up into... Let's do, th let's do that because it's, it's not the formality of the worship. It's still an opportunity to worship. At the same time, there is something to a, a specialness when somebody plays a hymn and you put your money, you know, in a plate. Understand that. So when we came and had buildings, we just put a box in the back and continued to do that. But it was never intended as a depreciation for the aspect of worship. I remember very well when I was a kid, they took up a loose change offering and they always had these stainless steel offering plates that clanged. And so we're going to have a loose, loose change offering tonight. So they passed it around and, you know, everybody's waiting, especially the kids. I had a pocket full of pennies because I knew it was coming. It wasn't quarters, but I had a pocket full of pennies. And when you drop those in the plate, everybody goes, ooh, you know. <laughs> I've seen offerings taken with chicken buckets. At revival services at tent meetings, Kentucky fried chicken buckets. Yeah. <laughs> but what were we doing? We're, we were worshiping the Lord. And when you put your money in the box, you are worshiping the Lord. You're saying, Lord, you are Lord of everything and you are Lord of my substance. And I am so thankful. Talk to him about this. 
You don't have to do it the way I do it. I get paid once a month, but I divide it up anyway because I want to take that envelope. You don't have to do that. But if you don't have a plan to do that, you're going to watch another month go by and you're going to, oh, yeah. Oh, then there's that. If I come here Sunday and there's no music, you know, the part of the worship that we enjoy together and I just you're going, what is he doing? And I say, oh, oh, yeah. Then there's that. You're going to say, well, I'm sorely disappointed, Pastor, because I came to worship. I want you and I want me to get this thing up where it's supposed to be. It's part of our worship. And you are privileged and I am privileged to do this. So you got to have a plan to do it. And whatever God has given you, you have a responsibility to give him the first fruits, to give him the tithe, and uh, to, to minister in that way. The mission is advanced. God is glorified, Jesus Christ is exalted, and the mission is advanced in its various aspects. The highlights for me, and I, I don't mean this in contrast to hands-on ministry, because I love you folks. I love people I've pastored through the years that aren't here. But I can tell you, the high water for me is when we recommend several, sending several thousand dollars to the mission field. That's not for boasting rights because I don't go any pastors and ladies to boast. It, it's, it's the mission. It's great commission. And so over the years, every time we've had, last year we had $10,000 income over expenses. We divided it in half, put half of it in the building fund, put half of it in the missions fund. And we sent $13,000. We spent, we sent $10,000 to Aquila to get a car for his wife who was riding a motorbike with a baby on her back. And we spent $3,000 getting a PA system and uh, a generator, a solar generator, and the sound system, and getting all of our extra tables and chairs to Africa. That's a highlight. Why is that a highlight? Because that, that's the Great Commission, right? And we're not always able to do that. And we've done a lot more than we're able to do now. But the point is, God is glorified, Christ is exalted. The mission is advanced. The mission is advanced. And we're edified. I couldn't send $13,000 to Aquila. Michael probably couldn't send $13,000 to Aquila. We sent $13,000 to Aquila. We trained dozens of Chinese pastors. We paid for them to be trained. I could not have paid for that myself. I raised eight children. <laughs> yeah. But I could be part of that and have been part of that. And you know what it does? It thrills my soul. It edifies me every month when I put the requisition together for our missionaries. It just thrills me. I think about our folks, the Perrys, the Bourbons, such contrastive ministry, but carrying the gospel having little Bible studies with folks and introducing them to Christ. So that is an introduction to grace giving. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time tonight. I thank you for the spirit of these folks. I am not here to scold. I am not here to do anything other than to share in the great blessing of anticipating everything that you have for us and everything that you've ordained for us and the continuation of those things together. So I pray that we would receive these things in the spirit that they have been given both by the apostle and by this pastor. As inadequate as I am, I pray that these things would just resonate with hearts, that your Holy Spirit would take these things and that, Father, in the days to come, we would broaden our understanding Continue to live in our, within our means, but Father, at the same time, be participants in everything that you have for us. I thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.